Welcome and thank you for joining us on Birth Mother Matters in Adoption with Kelly Rourke Scary and me, Ron Rains, where we delve into the issues of adoption from every angle of the adoption triad. Do what's best for your kid and for yourself because if you can't take care of yourself, you're definitely not going to be able to take care of that kid and that's not fair. And I know that my daughter will be well taken care of with them. Don't have an abortion. Give this child a chance. All I could think about was needing to save my son. My name is Kelly Rourke Scary. I am the executive director, president, and co-founder of Building Arizona Families Adoption Agency, the Donna K. Evans Foundation, and creator of the You Before Me campaign. I have a bachelor's degree in family studies and human development and a master's degree in education with an emphasis in school counseling. I was adopted at the age of three days, born to a teen birth mother, raised in a closed adoption and reunited with my birth mother in 2007. I have worked in the adoption field for over 15 years. And I'm Ron Raines. I've worked in radio since 1999. I was the co-host of two successful morning shows in Prescott, Arizona. Now I work for my wife, who's an adoption attorney, and I'm able to combine these two great passions and share them on this podcast. Adoption and abortion in the media and the news so the ohio supreme court oh <laughs> sorry <laughs> go ahead still a buckeye <laughs> and i dropped it again <laughs> states that a minimal payment of child support does not retain the right to stop adoption a parent may lose the right to object to the adoption of a child by failing without justifiable cause to make child support payments as required by law or judicial decree, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled February 26th. And I found this story interesting. So in essence, what it was, was uh, a married couple got divorced. They had had a child. He went out of state and she had the child in, in Ohio. Now he was in Kansas, I believe. And for the year preceding this court decision, he had literally only paid $200 in child support. He was assessed to pay $85 a week in child support. Right. And he essentially paid $200 so they were married in Indiana. for the entire previous year. Okay. Now, he even said that he was actually making more money and was completely able to. He just didn't like the idea of where he thought the mother was going to be spending the money. And I don't think you get to make that choice when it comes to child support. You know, you may not like it and maybe you can bring up a court case against what she's doing with the money, but you can't just refuse to pay. Well, an order is an order. A court order is a court order. Yeah, you need to follow it. At the time of the hearing, the father owed more than $17,000 in unpaid child support. When you're looking at $75 a week, that's a lot of weeks. I think that this is really going to stir up a lot of emotions because, again, you know, one state takes a stance and then other states follow suit. Right, or right. But it's a pendulum. It. So the pendulum right. has swung really far. And so, and in, a, in essence, though, what ended up happening was the mother had met and married somebody else who wanted to adopt the child. And this guy was saying, no, I don't consent to this. And the court said, it doesn't matter if you consent because you haven't been paying child support like you had been ordered. So that's essentially the gist of it. Am I correct? Yes. Where I am mixed on this Mm -hmm. is I do believe, and you know, I have as, you know, I have a blended family. So obviously I have divorce in my past Mm -hmm. and I do think that child support um, when it's ordered should be paid you know, to the letter of the law. Right. I think that is, I also can say having been a single mom, I I do agree that a woman who is parenting a child should not have her spendings um, under a microscope. Exactly. I mean, see, and that's a tough line because what if as the mother, you're out there spending that money on crack? I think that should be Well, then that's where the state, honestly, if you were to go down that road, then that's where... The state um, child Protective comes Services in comes in, and, and then and then the child would probably ultimately be placed with the father. Mm-hmm. Bye Bye Love is a great movie. I do remember that. Remember the exchanging at McDonald's uh, yep. in the parking lots. You know, there were so many 
instances in that movie, I'm like, oh, that's more real life than people realize. Absolutely. And I remember uh, Randy Quaid was telling um, his ex-wife, you know, oh, I see where my child support's going. You got brand new tires. <laughs> and she said, yeah, what every woman wants. You know, <laughs> and that's, <laughs> you know, so when yeah. child support is going to, you know, the safety of a vehicle that your child is being transported in. You That's know. legitimate. Right. But right. Randy Quaid was saying like, wow, you know, you new tires, nice huh? Nice tires. Right. right? <laughs> Got some Michelins. And <laughs> and so it wasn't. Living high on the hog with you and your new tires. Right. And I think they were Michelins, right? I mean, yeah, he was, yeah. he was dead. You know, she went to Sears and she got her some new tires. Woo! So, and, you know, I can tell you as a mom and as a woman. New tires is nowhere in our top hundred right. of not what going, we would. Mm, diamond ring, new tires. I, yeah, I <laughs> not gotcha. too flashy. We don't care what brand the tires yeah, are. Yeah, just as long as they work and we're safe with the tires. Correct. Right? And and so I think that I am <laughs> I am divided in this. You come at it from two perspectives. I do, and, and right. I come at it from even more because you know you and I have have talked you know on and off the microphone about being candid again we want to educate people and we want to be real you know my oldest daughter's uh dad is a different dad than my other three right and uh he was behind in his child support pretty similar my ex-husband did wind up adopting her it wasn't due to the child support it was due to the lack of interaction the lack of parenting Mm -hmm. the presence I think that I don't know that I would agree that solely based upon a monetary figure, I think that that is something that should be taken into consideration. And I do think that, you know, I, I strongly believe, and as an agency, we do step parent adoptions, and right. I and I and I believe in them a thousand percent. I think there needs to be, you know, reason substantiating. Not just, like you said, fiduciary, but also right. I, I think that solely if, other factors. if you have a father that is 100% involved in the child's life and is at, at school events and is taking the child on the weekends and is participating in their childhood and just not paying support, I don't think that's a reason. Right. Um, and I don't know all you of look the at ins the whole and picture. outs. Right. Uh, I think that, you know, obviously the child wasn't living in the same state as his father Mm -hmm. and i don't know if that was you know part of the reason maybe he wasn't as involved i don't know like i said all of the other ins and outs of it was he making phone calls was he sending letters or in today's day and age was he doing skypes was he doing facetimes now you know in my own personal uh, experience that wasn't occurring with my daughter. He had been um, out of her life for uh, I think it was almost ten years. Wow! And s- without any contact, and so there wasn't you know just unpaid child support, and and it was it was a, a bigger disconnect. picture thing. Right? And we were in the same state, and so yes, there was you know How does big she differences. Do with that, I think it's very hard on a child it, when it, yeah. when they have a sense of abandonment of one parent and you know at the time my daughter very much wanted to be adopted by her stepfather and that was something that was beautiful and amazing when we do these as an agency as a mom when when you start the process of a step parent adoption and I can say this from personal experience there is some part of you that wants to see is he going to fight for her is he going to stand up is he going to try you kind of want to see that and just when, for just her because sake or the child's sake. sake. Yeah. yeah. And so that's really, really hard when, you know, some don't even show up for the hearing. Um, in in my case, uh, mine did show up for the hearing. Mm-hmm. And he openly agreed to the adoption. He consented to it. Mm-hmm. He okay. consented to it. And he still had asked to be a part of her life and of course I you know I I would never say no to that I would never you know try to keep him from her but I think that when there's a divorce and you have a parent that chooses to not be a part of that child's life I think it is the moral and ethical in every area 
right thing to do is to let the parent who is raising that child step up and and be pronounced that child's father. Because again, adoption, it makes a family. And when you are a child and you have a parent that is not involved in your life, and you have one that is, you want to be, you want to carry his last name. You want him to be listed on your birth certificate. You want that connection. And that's why I think also that foster children want so badly to be adopted because they want that permanency. And that is what step-parent adoption also creates. It's permanency. And the, you know, if you, as a child, have already experienced one divorce and that's your mom and your dad divorcing, it would be foolish to believe that they don't always have that fear in their head when their mom remarries or their dad remarries, that that's going to happen again. It's forever going to be in their head because it's already happened once. Right. And giving that child permanency by with that parent, because that is an end of, you know, it's a relationship exclusive of the relationship that a stepfather has with his, her mother or his mother. Right. And I think that that, I think that's important. I, Again, I think this law is is very bold and brave, and I think that um, it's coming. I think there are good things behind it. I'm not sure. I 100 percent agree with it based with solely the implementation on, of it. Right. I think that there are probably more circumstances that we're not reading and understanding for a decision to be made. I know in the state of Arizona, you really have to have to substantiate uh, abandonment. Right. And that is... Not just financial abandonment. But no, it has to be global yeah. abandonment. And yeah. there's a lot to be said for that. I, I really stand for the children that that want to be adopted by a step-parent. And when they have a parent that is not involved in their lives, I, I do think it's the right thing to do. I know that my daughter used to sleep with an adoption book underneath her pillow. Hmm. And she really wanted it. And so when when that happened... Um, I was grateful that uh, her father did show up, at least, and... And signed the consent. And signed the consent. Yeah, yeah. And so he did do the right thing in the end. In this case, the court found that the father did not even come close to doing what was required by the judicial decree. He paid less than 5% of what the court order required for the mm -hmm. year preceding the adoption petition and owed more than 17000 in total unpaid support. The father did not challenge the probate court's finding that he lacked a justifiable cause to not make the payments. The court affirmed that the probate's court decision that the father's consent was not required. In his concurring opinion, Justice Fisher maintained that contrary to the lead opinion, he found RC 3107.07a is ambiguous. He noted that not only are the Supreme Court justices divided in their interpretation of the law, but so are lower courts, with some ruling that even a meager contribution of support satisfies the requirement, while others have ruled that more than a minimal payment is required. I think what was interesting is the law is triggered to strip parents of their right to consent to an adoption is measured by time, not by the amount of support paid, Justice Kennedy stated in her dissent. She also wrote that the majority failed to understand the practical realities of domestic relations law. And this is her quote. Although many people use a step-parent adoption to bring a blended family together, it may also be misused as a tool for removing a natural parent from a remarried parent's life. I do agree that there are cases, because we do these within our agency, that we do that we won't assist a family in termination for that reason. We right. assist it, you know, based on uh, an abandonment. Um, I think the majority of them is on abandonment. And... I think that uh, Justice Kennedy, when she stated that the General Assembly established this duration requirement for a reason, which was one year, the failure to contact or support a child for a period of one year raises a presumption that the parent has abandoned his or her parental rights and responsibilities. It has long been recognized that although parents have a paramount right to the care and custody of their children, that the right can be voluntarily relinquished or it can be lost by abandonment of the child or becoming totally unable to provide for the child's support or care. I think in the cases that we've done, I think it's two years. And I think Arizona, I don't, don't quote me on this, but I think it's closer to two years. Right. Whereas this court is saying a period of one year. I think that a lot can happen in a one year. I'm not sure one year is really in my own sufficient. professional and personal experience. I don't think mm -hmm. one year is sufficient. I think that two years is is more... 
appropriate. I think the other thing that should be considered is a child's age. And when you look at, you know, a childhood is 18 years. Right. And if you wait too long, then how much childhood do they have left? Now, the love of, you know, a step parent, should the adoption then becomes a parent, go through, you know, it doesn't stop at 18. But in that childhood time. Right. Those those formative years. You don't want to you don't want it to go on too long. Right. Because you want them to experience that. But. This is so powerful because I think this is going to open up Pandora's box. I was worried uh, in some good ways and in some bad ways. I Agreed. Think. Yeah. Because I think the most important thing is the child. But like you said, it is the, the bigger global picture of, you know, the totality of what this is about. Not just finances or not just time spent with the kid, but everything, you know, is... Is there abandonment? And right. And I think that's really what it should fully. be based on. I, right. I think rather than just segmenting child support, the financial aspect. Right. And we don't know the other circumstances. Maybe he hasn't talked to his kid in two years and just right. sends a $200 check every year to go, okay, well, he wasn't at least even I did that, something. Really. Yeah. Right. Or at minimal. Sure. Right. Um, the RC 3107.07 was not enacted to punish a parent for not fully complying with support orders. And other state laws provide criminal penalties for parents who fail to pay support that is not stated. Now, I have to say, and I will go on the record to say this, when you see the billboards of the parents that have not paid child support and how much they owe, right? I do find that hilarious. <laughs> I do. I do find that hilarious because, because honestly, you are as a parent responsible for that. I mean, my father never paid child support as I was a kid, you know, when I was growing up. And was he ordered I mean, to do so? Yeah, he went to jail a couple of times. Um, yeah. So he just and I, he would from time to time, but it wasn't a regular thing. It wasn't anything my mom could count on to raise us. She had to, you know, fend for herself. And I do remember at least on two occasions he went to jail. And so. how did you feel about that? I don't know. Maybe because my father wasn't around for us, it didn't affect me too much. And maybe partly because I'm a guy and it's just like, okay, toughen up, just deal with it. And and it doesn't matter. You know, he probably deserved it. And, and he never tried to have a relationship with it. did you as a child think about, it. okay, my dad's sitting in jail right now? Did, like, did that go through your head? Did it bother you? Because, you know, that never occurred in, in my daughter's situation. Of right. Him. But if it had, I wouldn't have told her. No. Um, I honestly don't remember how I processed it at the time. It was just something that I knew. I I don't know. Maybe you overheard somebody saying something or... Right. Probably one of my brother or my brother or my sisters saying yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. So, I again, I think this is Pandora's box. I think this is... Um, I think this is really interesting. You know, as this... It'll be interesting to see what happens following this case, not only in that state, but how other states mm -hmm. look at it. And federally, if they're going to jump in and, you know, enact some laws, because, you know, the appellate process is always a potential game changer. Right. And I think that it's important to, to really watch these kinds, especially for me, because we do have this program in um, our agency. And I think when it's used correctly, it's it's beautiful, and I think it's beneficial. But there are circumstances where it may not be. Yeah, it could be wielded as a weapon. No, I think in a year's time, I think people can have... We've all had a bad, a bad year. year, right? Yeah, and that may have just been a bad year for for him. And But it sounds like, you know, I mean, if you owed 17000 there was more than one. There was more than one, one bad, bad year, year certainly. <laughs> So that being said, yes. And then I want to go. And maybe they should have taken that full amount into consideration more so than the 200 he spent for the one previous year to the law. Agreed. Oh, yeah. Agreed. Okay. Though I have to bring this up again just because yeah. I love this story so much. And I, again, I'm giving a shout out to Southwest Airlines, which I do happen to fly a lot. So if anyone's listening from Southwest, you, you might you see me. You can send that check right over to Building Arizona Families anytime you want. Or yep. credit, free flight, whatever you want right. to do here. I think that kudos to the flight attendants. And it's so it's so funny to me. And again, it, it really dates me 
as I say, flight attendants, because we didn't call them flight attendants back then. Stewardesses. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that that just rolled right off your tongue also dates you. <laughs> right. I mean, I've seen TV where they talk. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Yeah. Those old movies. <laughs> yeah. So the story goes, it had been nine long years of fertility treatments, miscarriages, and adoption stress. But Dustin and Karen Moore finally were on a flight home with their adopted baby girl in their arms. They nervously cradled their daughter, who was just eight days old. Mid-flight from Colorado to California on November 9th, Dustin Moore realized that the baby needed a diaper change. A Southwest Airlines flight attendant named Jenny led the couple to a space where they could change their slightly fussy newborn. Jenny and another passenger complimented my beautiful daughter and asked what prompted a flight with such a young infant. I guess he tweeted this. See, we're, we're still cool though, Ron, because we can say tweeted. <laughs> I gave them the shortened adoption story, he said, which do they hastily offered congratulations and shared a few more kind remarks. Back in the seats, a flight attendant named Bobby approached the Moors, inquired about their little girl, and when he left, Dustin Moore and Karen Moore looked at each other, confused about the attendant's interest. Right. Five minutes later, Bobby came on the intercom and said, Ladies and gentlemen, there's a very special guest on the flight today. She's only eight days old, and she's traveling I'm home getting with chills. her mom and dad. No, this is sweet. Moore said in an interview with the Washington Post, the flight attendant announced he'd be passing out napkins and pens for anyone who wanted to jot down a message for the new parents. The cabin erupted in cheers and applause, which is just beautiful. A uh, steady stream of people came by to ooh and on ah congratulate the couple. Dustin Moore had said we had no expectation that they would have done something like that. He gets choked up just thinking about it. I'm getting choked up just reading about yeah. it. And me hearing it, right. One of the napkins said, I was adopted 64 years ago. Thank you for giving this child a loving family to be a part of. Us adopted kids need a little extra love. Congratulations. And so the crew collected all the napkins and read them out loud. Beautiful story. Kudos to... Yep. Definitely bears repeating. So thank you. Yes. I, I love that story. That's probably so far my favorite story of the year. Granted, it's only March, but... <laughs> But somebody out there, come on, top it. Yeah, I was going to say, what does this year have left to hold? So that's it for news in the media and a lot of tangents and insight and personal opinions on our behalf. Yep. But thanks for sticking with us. We have a pregnancy crisis hotline available 24-7 by phone or text at 623-695-4112. Or you can call our toll-free number 1-800-340-9665. We can make an immediate appointment with you to get you to a safe place, provide food and clothing, and start it on creating an Arizona adoption plan or give you more information. You can check out our blogs on our website at azpregnancyhelp.com. Thank you for joining us on Birth Mother Matters and Adoption, written and produced by Kelly Rourke scary and edited by me ron rains if you enjoy this podcast rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts and as always thanks to grapes for letting us use their song i don't know as our theme song join us next time for birth mother matters in adoption for kelly rourke scary i'm ron rains and we'll see you then